Fontaine, being the newest nation at the time of this video, we're only in 4.1, it's very water-based and definitely has a lot of lingering colour and overall nostalgia feel to it. Blue and teal take over the landscapes at any turn, and underwater diving is a big part of what makes this nation so defining and distinct. However, I'm not trying to praise Fontaine or anything. I'm here to discuss a topic I haven't seen being talked about. It's dynamic with Monster. Subconsciously, I always associated these two nations together, but now that I can visit them both in person, I understand why even more. Whether it's their shared colour scheme, ignore Stejnaya, the similar architecture, nature, or similar gourds, it's all being discussed here in why Monster and Fontaine are related. Like and subscribe if you enjoy, and spoilers ahead. Firstly, what makes a nation a nation? Partially the element it's themed around. Consider Monstat's Animo or Fontaine's Hydro, for example. Oh, they both end with O, oh, I'm kidding. Anyway, Animo is inherently free to flow wherever it wants, as the winds take people where they must go and course throughout the world. The majority of Animo characters have a lot of mobility based moves, as well as wind moves, a lot. I don't know if you can tell where I'm going as I use the term flows to describe the element's behaviour, but Hydro and Animo share this property. Pyro destroys, Electro connects, Dendro and Geo creates, and Cryo stops. Hydro and Animo flow with no elements and drive the world forward. Just as the winds take people on adventures, theoretically, if you're in water, the currents would do the same as well, would it not? Even Animo's main elemental reaction, Swirl, describes a behavior Hydro can also create, as water can literally swirl. Swirls of the Stream, the Sumeru battle theme, describes this well with its title. I bet I sound like some crazy conspiracy theorist right now, and to be honest, I am. Finally, I just want to say that a lot of the technology in Fontaine is for movements such as elevators or buses. However, these movement-based technologies are driven by, you guessed it, water. In the real world, wind and water can both be used to create power through either windmills or... I forgot the name of the water ones. Even the main city of Mondstadt is surrounded by Cider Lake, which, when compared to the main city of Fontaine, looks remarkably similar. For all we know, in 4.2 and above, even more things could surface to assist in my argument. Of course, that previous point was part of the environment argument, which is the next section. But anyway, if you're bored of this section already, just keep in mind that I have a lot more things to discuss, such as storyline, gourds, elemental dragons, environments, and even characters. If we don't count the upcoming Farina and Siege Wind as well, or even any Fontaine characters at all, including Animo and Hydro Traveller as a more desperate backup point, there were 10 Animo and 10 Hydro characters. Every other element besides Dendro or Geo is above that threshold, or the two previously mentioned are below it. Seems like a coincidence? I think not. These numbers are all 3.9 or below to ensure fair competition between them, by the way. Also, finally, Animo and Hydro are blue. Yeah. They also have extremely lively vibes in their nations in retrospect to that blue, which isn't the same life as Dendro or the same blue as Cryo, as Cryo is like the opposite of life and Dendro is way too lively. Hydro and Animo sit right in a perfect spot of refreshing but not overdoing it. Did that even make sense? I hope you enjoyed that part, because it was the most shallow bit. We're going from worst to best here, so strap in. Time to discuss environments, from nature to architecture, to even the geology of the place. I see you, Zhongli. Mondstadt has a very generic nature. Like, really generic. It's mountainous, but if you want to get real mountainous, Leeway has them all. Now, while we thought Leeway was similar to Mondstadt, just look at Fontaine. Besides the many blues throughout it, it's identical to Mondstadt. Inazuma has darkened or more tealless grass, Leeway is themed around Auden, and Sumeru is just a lot of nature or zero nature, while Mondstadt and Fontaine are super similar. The main difference is the amount of water though. Fontaine is of course filled to the brim with bodies of water, whether it's the current entrance, massive lakes surrounding the city, or just the island-like geography, and Mondstadt is quite different. It contains more solid bodies of lands in contrast, until you get to Leeway which has marshes and clear sections throughout the nearby ocean region. Ignoring this fact, Mondstadt and Fontaine are both mountainous where they can be in natural ways, while a place like Leeway has very narrow mountains as a majority of them are spears. Fontaine and Mondstadt have cliffs a lot of the time, I mean just look at Star Snatch cliffs. It used to be so annoying to traverse when I started out. On top of that, look at Old Mondstadt, which is literally surrounded by cliffs. Total opposite to the new town, so I think I've made my point there. Same green colour, same geography, and same everything. Just ignore the stark water difference. Now, a big part of environments throughout this world isn't just the geography, but also the architecture. You might initially think that these places have very different buildings, but I'm not talking about mods that's new stuff, I'm talking old. Funny how the old stuff looks the most like the new stuff in Fontaine, but it's true. Old Mondstadt is extremely grand in design no matter how you look at it, and then if you look at Fontaine, 
It just looks a more modern and cleaned up version of odd ones that in the quad region specifically, though there's similar stuff in other areas. Have you ever looked over the empty region between Fontaine, Leeway and Mondstadt? You can see Storm Terror's lair from Fontaine, and it really does look like it could fit in with the Hydro Nation. Anyway, I think that's the environment covered. I can't say much about the underwater areas besides you can go under the water, and in Mondstadt you can go above the sky. There's opposites and similarities alike. Hopefully that was a little more convincing than my reads on the elements. And now, we have what I find to be the most convincing part of my analysis and theory, the characters and story. Storm Terror, New Villettes, Fiorina, Venti, and more will be brought up here as I find connections through foiling and patterns. Let's go. Before I start this part, I have a question. Have you seen much mention of the elemental dragons throughout the different nations? I don't think so. Sure, they exist and it's obvious, but have you seen them be directly involved with the storyline? Well, maybe twice, and of course, I'm bringing this up because there's two examples that link straight back to our main subjects, Fontaine and Monster. There's a commonality and difference to be found here specifically. Storm Terror, or Tavalin, is the main elemental dragon of Mondstadt and is prevalent throughout the story due to his integration. He's shown as the main antagonist for majority of the prologue, though of course he's not all that bad. He helps bring the Abyss into the spotlight as they're the ones stirring his trouble up, and it's cool that he does this. Tavalin is effectively Venti's sidekick throughout all of this, and the story is about that relationship breaking and being on Venti's side to contact the antagonistic Tavalin. However, in Fontaine, Nuvillet is the elemental dragon as shown in the most recent Archon quest. Some thought he was a god, and that would have screwed up my idea for this video, so thank god he's not, because now it helps my theory. Instead of Nuvillet being the antagonist of the story, he's more of a support, much like Venti, who helps you learn the ways of the nation and gets you around, even going against the rules to get you into prison, much like how Venti tries to steal the liar. But because of the dragon's supportive role in this case, it makes sense that Venti's equal, Farina, takes up the missing spot the misunderstood, distant antagonist. Verena is hurting much like Storm Terror, and while not evil, definitely gets in the way because of the thorn in the head placed by others, such as Alakino or the Prophecy. This is similar to how the Abyss does the same with Zavala. However, just because Farina and Venti have opposite roles, doesn't mean that they're also opposites themselves. Monster and Fontaine both touch on the concept of not judging the book by its cover, whether it's for the sake of freedom or justice. Roles aren't everything because of this. Besides the fact the names Fosalors and Barbados have the same amount of letters, so does Chris and Arlen for some reason. Their approach to being Archons and their personalities have a lot of interesting similarities. Let's talk about designs first. Well, mostly one thing. While Nahida is the only childlike Archon, Raiden and Jong Lee share a body type. However, they came right after one another, and Venti never got his equivalent, till Farina showed up. They're both medium sized models, similar to how Raiden and Zhong Lee are tall ones. And funny enough, personalities match up perfectly with these design matchings. Much like how Zhongli and Raiden are both cold and calculated, Farina and Venti are childish gremlins who are more about enjoyment and running away from their problems. Though I guess the only Archon who hasn't run away is Nahida. Farina and Venti are both distant but close to their people simultaneously, as Venti hangs out with them with zero god interaction, and Farina tries to play god but is literally too weak as we see in her many encounters with Arlecchino and ends up playing as a celebrity. The other three Archons aren't this close to their people. In fact, Farina literally has appointments with her citizens as we hear of in Act 1 of Chapter 4. Another interesting point in the themes of these two nations being freedom and justice. These are both opposites, and interchangeable to an extent depending on what kind of person you are interestingly enough. Your personality can flow to the personal definition either way, much like wind and water, huh? To be free is to give and receive justice fairly, as after that's done, you're left with a free soul of no regrets or grudges theoretically. Alongside this, to give justice, you need to be free enough to connect with others and yourself ethically, not being held back by unnecessary things. On the contrary, you could simply see it as freedom is free while justice holds you accountable. In the end, I do think the second one holds more true in this scenario, as Paimon and the Traveller both admit they've been more cautious in Fontaine and are therefore less free than they are in Monster. It's like Fontaine was in the past than Monster was in the future. I mean, Fontaine is built like old Mondstadt, Venti is Farina if she got out of her denial and accepted herself as weak instead of hiding behind things like justice, and in the end, she limits herself because of it. Now, I've got one more thing to bring up, the Fitui Harbingers and their involvement in these chapters. The Fitui are seen as Snezhnaian diplomats applying subtle pressure to the main supports in both the prologue and Act 4. In Mondstadt, it's Jean's burden as the Archon gave his people freedom, and in Fontaine, it's the Archon and Nuvillette as they have their meetings with Arlecchino who threatens them both. 
It's funny how in Monster, neither the Harbinger or Archon, being the main leads of each side, never face each other to the end, while in Fontaine, the Archon and Harbinger face each other directly right off the bat. Alucino and La Signora are very similar in nature too, and finally both attack the Archons directly and neither have respect for those said Archons, having clear bad blood with them. Also, just a hunch, but I think these will both be the only nations that do not have direct Harbinger boss fights. I think that's all I need to say, and I tried to summarise this last part quicker as this section has become quite lengthy. Let's end this off with a chill note, because what could all of this mean? I've rambled on long enough with my analysis, so now it's time for my theory. It's important to ask ourselves what exactly Monster meant to both the story, the player, and the world. It and Fontaine both have more refreshing, calmer feels to the story. While the stories have stakes, it feels a lot more self-contained than other nations, especially Sumeru. I think this is because the Fatui is such a big focus of Li Wei and Inazuma, while Sumeru has things like the Ermin Soul and really does need its core due to Skadamish. However, Fontaine's stakes are quite literally only Fontaine. The prophecy, Fatui's actions, and even the primordial seed to an extent are only really affecting Fontaine and the Fontaineans. Much like our Monster was only about Monster, the Abyss was only trying to attack Monster, and so were the Fatui. I know the Abyss are attacking other stuff, but we didn't know about that at that point. They're both self-contained, introductory breaks from the constant roller coaster of the world being in danger, and it is an interesting approach that they're returning to that. Fontaine and Monster have three other nations worth of storyline between them all, and in three nations from Fontaine, the story will be over, including Natlan, Snezhnaya, and Kanria. All will be in Celestia, don't know what this can mean though. I didn't have a clear goal when talking about this, just that it's interesting how the beginning and halfway points of the story have so much in common, and so much extremely opposite to each other. Maybe Fontaine is meant to come off like Monster, but will do something massive in Act 5? It's possible since Mondstadt isn't just similar, but also completely different in some areas too. Perhaps Fontaine will be chilling to the Abyss quest, which will blow the story right open. We'll just have to see. Time for the conclusion, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. But also, 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 the future me here, or well, I'm recording in the same recording as I just was, but I just have to say, I make a really good point in the next section, so I need you guys to stay around if you're actually curious about what I'm talking about, because I think this confirms my whole theory. Um, You'll hear it in the next section, because it's in the script. There's definitely something going on here. At first, I thought I was as crazy as someone in a rubber room full of rats, but after writing this, there is so much to connect. I'm sure other nations may have things in relation too, so I'll have to see. This is the good point I was talking about. If Fontaine is so heavily connected to Monster, maybe Natlan and Leeway, Inazuma and Stejnaya, and Sumeru and Kanria... Wait, that actually makes sense. Wait, what? A lot of us think Snezhinaya and Inazuma are going to be similar due to their Archons, and on top of that, Kanria is literally inside Sumeru, and both had no gourd for either a while or their whole lifetime. Holy moly, this could actually be true to some extent. If those nations match up, then Li Wei and Natlan may match up, and Fontaine and Mondstadt may actually be matching up right now. We'll just have to see, I mean, if Sumeru finally made Denjo playable, will Kanria make the Abyss playable to match those nations? Uh, yeah, well, let's see. Like and subscribe and have a good day, night, or afternoon. Thanks for watching.